Hi, I'm Laura Flanders. This week on the show, Academy Award nominee Viggo Mortensen on speaking out for justice and remembering to act. All that and a few words from me on Hillary Clinton's warmth and her wars. Welcome to our program. You may know our next guest as an Academy Award-nominated actor who has appeared in scores of movies, including The Lord of the Rings, one of the highest-grossing film series of all time. What you may not know is he's also a poet, photographer, musician, and painter. He speaks four languages, and he's the founder and publisher of an independent publishing house, Percival Press. The 12th anniversary edition of Percival's collection of essays in response to the Iraq occupation, Twilight of Empire, was released this winter with essays by Mike Davis, Amy Goodman, Jody Evans, and Dennis Kucinich, among others, and with a foreword from Howard Zinn. I'm very glad that it brings Viggo Mortensen to our program. Viggo, welcome to the program. Thanks for having me. So glad to have you. Twilight of Empire. Twelve years ago, we thought it was a twilight. What happened? Well, the empire continues to crumble, but like most empires, if not all of them, when they go down, they don't go down gracefully, and they cause a lot of harm around them as they go down. It's a book that <clears throat> we had run out of our stock because fortunately it had uh, the couple editions we've we've printed had had, had sold out, and I, I reread the book. I hadn't read the whole thing for for many years, and. Uh, I started looking at these essays and poems and reports from Americans, Canadians, uh, Iraqis, uh, you know, on the ground reports from, from Baghdad and other places in Iraq and, you know, all kinds of people contributed to this in 2003 uh, when the invasion and occupation of Iraq was happening. And on reading it again, on the one hand, as an editor, I thought, well, great. This, I mean, this book is still really timely. Uh, and on the other hand, as a human being, I thought, how unfortunate. Yeah. <laughs> this material yeah. is still timely. And then we're, the story hasn't changed. It's, it's just become more complex. Yeah. It's become worse. The consequences that could have been predicted and were spoken about by people like Dennis Kucinich, like Howard Zinn, um, at the time, uh, they've come to pass, yeah. and then some. Yeah. And the mess we have in the Middle East and, and West Asia, I mean, it has a lot to do with what happened then. So I decided to reprint it, and I thought it would be good to have a couple of new essays. And fortunately, Anthony Arnov, who's um, co-author of another book I'm here for, uh, Voices of a People's History of the United States, Howard Zinn and Anthony Arnov put that together. Anthony wrote a really fine yeah. foreword, and so did Dennis Kucinich, yeah. who was a lone voice at the time, as you know. You want to read a little bit from what Dennis Kucinich had to say? I um, mean, he was lone, yeah. but there were, what, millions of people well, in the Well, no, streets there were millions, and he talks about that among other things. I mean, I'll read you the, just sure. the beginning of sure. it, because it's fairly long. Mm -hmm. It'll give you an idea of why, why I do this book now, what's the deal uh, about republishing this. Those of us who knew in 2002 that there was no cause to invade Iraq, those who raised their voices for the cause of peace, who gathered together, marched, protested, and lobbied incessantly against the unjust unjustified rush to war, summoned the power of their humanity to demand that America's leaders cease and desist from their ill-considered plan to attack that Western Asian country. With the publication of Twilight of Empire 12 years ago, all who cared enough to challenge the venality and prevarication of the U.S. government could have seen that a benchmark had been established in chronicling the abject corruption of this unprovoked aggression. Unfortunately, the will to war against Iraq was so powerful that it nullified the demands of millions of Americans who openly and voc vocally insisted Iraq should not be made to pay a price for the terrorist attacks of 9-11, which that country had nothing to do with. The will to war ignored all evidence brought forward in October mm -hmm. of 2002 and presently directed by myself to fellow members of Congress, which posited that Iraq had nothing to do with 9-11, that Iraq had no intention or capability of attacking the U.S., and that Iraq did not have weapons of mass destruction, and so on. Yeah. I mean, he kind of frames point. it 
from You say today. it very beautifully in your forward. You say that there is a dangerous gap. I think that's the words you use. The dangerous gap between what the media tell us and what can, I think you say, so readily be observed mm. um, on the ground. Twelve years on, what do you think is falling into that gap? What if you could get on a jet and go and see for yourself? Would you want to see and report? Well, it's as it's as much a conveyor belt uh, slash reality show as the endless stream of media, from the right, from the left, from the center, from overseas. Product, product, smoke screens, diversions, redirections. <coughs> whether it's the invasion of Iraq or or the theft of the election by, by you know, uh, George W. Bush and his helpers, including his brother Jeb Bush, the governor of Florida, his father George Herbert Walker Bush, um, whether it's the, the, the pretext, the flimsy pretext for invading Iraq in the first place. Um, you know, these things are talked about in passing, you know, let, let's, a fire crackle be th was thrown some time ago by, by Donald Trump just to get under Jeb Bush's skin about his father being inept or not being doing the right thing, mm -hmm. you know. Um, I mean, about uh, not his father, his brother George W. Bush, 9/11 um, or the invasion of Iraq itself, and so forth. But they, nobody really talks about the the real issues. Nobody gets to, yeah. to the heart of the matter. It's just personality issues, and it just keeps recycling. So. Some people do try to comment. Some people do try to get to the to the heart of the matter, but it's very few voices. But that's mind. such a perfect phrase, the heart of the matter, for, for what you do. Um, I mean, I have to say, when we were preparing for this interview, I didn't imagine that I would receive in the mail this <laughs> enormous shipment of books um, from Percival Press, your publishing house. Um, first, what's the mission of Percival? Uh, it's basically to publish books that that I, that I and, and the people that work with me feel deserve uh, to be published, you know, uh, material that des deserves to be seen and considered, but that either cannot get published uh, by someone else or doesn't get published in yeah. or hasn't been published in its entirety or the way the author would have liked, you know. So you have a lot of art books in there, a lot of poetry, a lot mm -hmm. of critical essays. I mean, in a sense, it's like, you know, you read a great book or you see, uh, you know, a play, and you get really excited about it. Or let's say maybe you, you read something on the net. Maybe you read the drone papers or something, and you want to pass that to everyone. You right. think, this is worth reading. This is, is thought-provoking. It's the same right. idea, but doing it from, from a publishing house. You know, I, look at this. I found this author, or I found this artist. I'd like to share it with you, and I'd like to share it with not just my friends, but And you strangers. publish a lot of people. But I will say that what surprised me most was your work, this incredible record of photography. Um, you've been taking photographs since you were a child mm. in high school, is that right? Yeah. yeah. Getting to the heart of the matter seems to be what you're doing with your photographs. Uh, what Try do you to. think you're doing? Yeah, <laughs> no, I'm trying to get to what exactly is going on right now, you know, what's happening. Uh, I think that one of the reasons people get distracted, you know, going back to this idea of smoke screens and people don't get to what's really going on, they'll bring up issues, they'll bring up politicians, but they, they won't take the opportunity to ask them the, the right. real difficult questions. Um, it's a question of remembering, you know, it's a question of, I think, that life. I've observed it with my parents and my grandparents, you know, who all have ha had full lives, but. Um, you know, it, it goes quickly. Yeah. It, it does go quickly, and it's worth paying attention. And the things that I value in memory are certain things that they wrote down, or images that they made. Um, you have a whole book about your son's departure um, oh, yeah. into adulthood. He didn't depart all that. Didn't go all that far. It turns out, but that no. sense of time. How else do you decide what you're photographing? There's a, there's a beautiful line in one of the introductions to. I think it's this book, the um, uh, sign, language. sign language book. Kevin Power uh, writes that by bringing his eye close to the subject, to the object, the photographer is initiating a relationship. And, and it reminded me of something that Brian Stevenson's grandmother said um, that he quoted when we had the great um, fighter against mass incarceration here on the show. He said his grandmother said, 
nothing that is really important can be understood from afar. You have to get up close. Mm, uh, it makes sense. You get up close. How do you pick what to get up close to? In some sense, by just by virtue of doing it all the time, whether you take a picture or not, just having a camera with you, uh, which is more common nowadays, you know, because every telephone is a camera. It's a completely different world. But it didn't used to be so normal to have a camera with you everywhere right. you went, in your pocket, in your bag, in your car, on the train, whatever. Um, but just by having it, just the, the idea that you might take a picture means that you're already looking at things with more attention, you know, you're paying more attention to detail, you know, almost like, I suppose, like a spy or something where they're allowed into a room for maybe a minute and then they're asked to leave and then they're asked to describe what was in the room and they can probably describe it very well, whereas if you or I do it, probably wouldn't remember the color of the sofa maybe, we might what was hanging on the wall, what objects were on the desk and in what order and so forth. You, it just because practice helps you just sort of see and select and also be more selective in terms of when you make images. You know, the idea that you just have to photograph everything, you can do that, it's fine. But, but I, like to, I like to also be there beyond taking the photograph because I think when you're taking the photograph, you're, you're as close as you can get with your camera, but you're not as close as you would be without your camera if you're paying yeah. a lot of attention. But the camera is like a, it's a sort of a tool. It's like wearing eyeglasses or something. Uh, I can see better. Um, but it's also good to think about it, to have some restraint. Mm -hmm. I think I think this is same. I found the same in acting. It's, you know, the phrase want to and don't. Want to say the thing, want to show that emotion and don't. And then what happens? You take the risk of not showing it and trusting that the audience will understand, mm -hmm. you know, and then, you know, want to take the picture and don't unless it's absolutely necessary. There are occasions when it's a, an event that's of such importance or a, a person that you're not going to see again and then you might want to shoot a lot. I mean, you know, I don't know. It's just a, but that a habit of recording, that's all. Recording and paying attention. I, mean, yeah. I can't help but think if we had known we were going to be for there for 12 years in Iraq, would we have paid closer attention? to the people? Probably not. That's, that's unfortunately, you know, the lessons we keep not learning. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's not, it's not like George W. Bush is Satan. Yes, I think that he and Colin Powell and Condoleezza Rice and Rumsfeld and Wolfowitz and Cheney, <laughs> you know, above all, and uh, so many people should be in jail. They're not going to be in jail. Um, unlikely. It's unlikely that the, the subject of Iraq, the real subject of it, why did we go and what has happened because of it, is that that's not even going to be debated yeah. in the president in the final lap when it's Democrat against Republican. It's just not going to happen. But, you know, and, and I think that it's something that's been going on for a long time. I mean, Hillary Clinton certainly is not going to talk about it. Uh, although she could. She could try to weasel her way into talking about it. I, I, don't, I don't see how she would be okay feel comfortable. Uh, she will probably try to justify her voting for the war in Iraq. Um, I don't know. It would probably be an uncomfortable moment that she would probably try to gloss over. I mean, the Clinton doctrine, her husband's presidency, it's, I mean, that started the whole thing that, that Bush followed and Obama follows today, which, which is a doctrine that says that the United States government assumes that it has the right to use unilateral military force anywhere it wants at any time uh, in order to secure resources, um, foreign markets, and to enforce yeah. its, 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 its you know, political aims all over the world. I mean, that, that's something that it, it keeps happening. I think it will keep happening. Mm -hmm. And so then I understand people that say, well, what's the point of voting? What's the point of uh, why even try? Why even talk about it? Um, I understand because it doesn't seem like it changes, but you have a choice. You either do something or you yeah, don't yeah. in life. You either uh, bear witness, which is what this book does and what this book does. Yeah. You either bear witness and, and say what these something books do. And, and, you, and you hope that some, there's yeah. some incremental change. I mean, I think that, you know, Hillary Clinton has been forced to speak about certain things, about um, economic justice uh, and inequality by Bernie Sanders. Right. Um, Although Bernie Sanders supported all those same oh wars. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, and about climate. You know, she's forced to talk a little bit about that. Um, but yes, he is, he was, he's, he's approved every 
<laughs> military appropriations <laughs> bill that she did. You have um, a lot of fans, of course, on Facebook and everywhere else. And we asked some of our Facebook followers um, if they had questions for you. Mm. And some of them had to do with the roles that you've played. Some people wrote about your uh, role in the Rings series, uh, the Lord of the Rings series, um, and talked about your character as mm. one who had gone from being sort of outsider to being alliance builder in chief. I'm wondering if you had a message there for people who are social change makers um, about making alliances. Um, I mean, he certainly is. When you brought up that, I, I thought about an article that appeared, I think it was in Time Magazine. It was a review. It's a little off the, I'll be quick about it, but when the second part came out, The Two Towers, I think it was Richard Corliss, if I'm wrong, sorry. But the person who wrote the review of that movie, and you have to remember this is 2002, in the, the heat of the, you know, the, the uh, almost, I wouldn't say joyful, but yeah, let's go, yeah. kind of almost like a sporting thing. Uh, we're going to, you know, we're going to do something about this and all this nonsense that was coming out in the fall of 2002. But the, the review that came out in December of 2002, when the plan to invade Iraq was obviously well underway and, and all, all, all systems go, talked about um, the character played by Christopher Lee, who recently passed away, a fine actor, playing Saruman, um, who, sent, who sends these hordes against Helm's Deep, the, you know, this uh, fortress at night in the rain. And it's a huge battle, all these orcs and, you know, baddies. And uh, he equated him, he said, well, the, not only is the resemblance striking, uh, but something else, I don't know, that it's clearly uh, Osama bin Laden and that the, um, that my character and the, and the alliance was very much the coalition of, of the willing. And I mean, <laughs> I was like, and I wrote them and I was like, are you kidding me? I mean, this is an important magazine and it's a magazine that in some sense represents, for better or for worse, the United States culturally uh -huh. it's around the world. It's on, or it was, it's on every newsstand around the world. It's like, how can you guys in good conscience say such a that's a lot of crap, you know, but that's, anyway. Yeah. We, have, we haven't talked about um, one of the stories that we're following a lot on this program, which has to do with the effort to um, end the prison system uh, as we know it. You have some amazing paintings. We've talked about photography, films. You're also a musician. I hope that we get to play some of your incredible work. But in here, there's a poem, I mean, a, a painting going back uh, a ways that you did in 1999, mm. um, having to do with isolation. Can, can you describe that one for us? You want to see it? Or, or get do that you off there. Okay. They'll come in closer in okay. a bit, probably. Uh, the painting's called Isolation and Its Effects on Colored Perception with the Passing of Time. <laughs> <It's a> long <laughs> title, for short, Isolation. So yes. you were studying the effects of color, of isolation on color perception back in 1999? Well, I was thinking about it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And uh, I'm trying to, you know, it's one reason to write things down and take photographs also is to record, but it's so that it's much as a, like a photo album, you know, a poem works the same way for me. I've never been very good at keeping a diary. I wish I were good at it, but my way of doing it is this, you know, or poems. And I can, I can also movies, you know, yeah. when I see a movie that I've done years ago, I can, I think more about the people that I was with and the, and the place and also what was going on in the world at the time. So you finally, um, I'm just curious about your outlook. I mean, anyone that observes what's going on as closely as you do and as we do um, mm. gets both the good and the bad yeah. in equal measure. I always talk about this sort of miracle of good. Given how awful everything is, it's kind of amazing that anyone's nice to anyone else at all. I agree. Um, it's amazing anybody brushes their teeth or, <laughs> or, or takes a shower. But I think of the road and, and I think <laughs> of the, just the, the, the sort of the picture that Cormac McCarthy and then the movie conjured up of, you know, armed gangs pillaging for food and corn, crops having failed. Mm. It, is that your vision of the future? You think that's where we're going? It's, if you don't consider it as a very real possibility, you're lying to yourself, yeah. you know, in the same way uh, that people have been lying to themselves for years about climate change, you know. I mean, that's, it's a real problem. And the proliferation of, of nuclear weapons is not something that's discussed at all yeah. these days. It's amazing. I mean, they're still there. There's more of them, you know. Uh, 
it can't be said that Israel has nuclear weapons. It can't be talked about. It can't be said that we have more and newer and better and that you know, nuclear power plants around the world, uh, are, including in this country, are deteriorating, are not safe. That there are other ways. There are clearly other ways to, to, to get energy. You know, it's not necessary. Mm. It's, it's a racket. Mm. You know? How do we get here? How, where are we exactly and how do we, get how do we move forward? All the themes of this program. I want to thank you so take, much for being here. People need to take matters into their own hands. Not just when things are bad. That's, the pro that's why things get bad. You know, we talk about Black Lives Matter, or we talk about the voices of a people's history in the United States, or a book like Twilight of Empire. You know, you're talking about a reaction to an already yeah. screwed up situation. And what you need to do is make a racket every day. Yeah. Not just when it gets bad. It's all like fix this broken thing. No, let's avoid it becoming broken. I want you to shout out to some of our audience members. We're, on, we're very proudly proud to be distributed on Telesur the Latin American Network, South America. and we have a big audience in one of your home countries. Argentina. Argentina. <laughs> now, I know you follow the uh, soccer closely, the football. I do. Um, any message to our Argentinian viewers? In Spanish? Sure. Bueno, un cariñoso saludo a todos los hermanos y las hermanas de Sudamérica, especialmente a los argentinos, y especialmente a los cuervos. Aguantes. I want a cyclone, Viva San Lorenzo. <laughs> <laughs> and we should just clarify, uh, you grew up, you were born in Manhattan, then you spent a lot of time in Buenos Aires. Yeah, I was born in Manhattan and as, a, as an infant, uh, my parents moved down there and I was, first decade of my life, I basically came back here when they split up when I was 11. There you go, <laughs> thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for all your work for Percival Press. We'll put more information about Percival Press, all of its books, as well as the People's History series and more at our website. A cyclone, a cyclone, a cyclone, a cyclone. <laughs> Big <laughs> ones. Thank you. Primary season is in its prime and feels familiar in almost every respect. Eight years on, it's the same candidate, the same point of contention. Is Hillary Clinton warm enough? Now, I'm not debating that this is sexist stuff, all that focus on her warmth, her style, her smile. Come on, why do women always have to be warm anyway? Was Lincoln warm? Was Eisenhower? It's just another double standard. The partisan press corps is packed with macho creeps. This much I agree. But when it comes to Clinton, it's not the warmth, it's the wars I'm worried about. I've actually read her books, both of them. And I don't think she's ever seen a bombing mission she didn't approve, going back to the 1990s, when the whole insidious humanitarian war idea took root. Bernie Sanders voted for NATO's bombing of Yugoslavia, too, so he should score no points from peaceniks on that account. Still, it really is pretty rich for Hillary Clinton to be out there posing as the great anti-gun and anti-violence crusader when you think of how that humanitarian war idea has played out killing people to save people, bringing democracy at the end of a rocket, backing rebels we know next to nothing about. It's been almost unending intervention and war since the Clintons let that particular genie out of the bottle. It was the wars on Yugoslavia that prepared the political ground for intervention in Iraq, Libya, Syria, you name it. And every one of those has led to a bloodbath and as of now a dangerous failed state. Clinton's coming on strong against the gun lobby and the NRA, but U.S. arms sales never did better than when she was Secretary of State. She approved what was, at that time, the largest ever U.S. arms sale to scary Saudi Arabia, even as she acknowledged in WikiLeaked cables that that place was the world's leading source of support for Sunni terrorist groups. Warmth, as far as I'm concerned, Clinton's shown way too much of it to wars and warmongers. And if you're really worried about machismo, ask the women of those failed states. From the Taliban to ISIS, they've been the first to pay the price. This program is also available as a podcast. Check it out. And you can write to me, laura at lauraflanders.com.